Welcome to the closing keynote of the DPC 2017. I would like to introduce to you the keynote speaker. That is uh, Marco Pivetta. Marco is a member of the Zen Framework CR team and a member of the Doctrine Core team. And he will talk about features in PHP you should never use. Give an applause to Marco Pivetta. Thank you very much. Do I switch that? Yeah. I'll switch that. I know how to use analog technology as well. Incredible. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for making me nervous. This is the first time. It's good. And I see some friendly faces, which means I will probably make it out of here alive. Um, so today we are talking about Sheila Buff. Anybody know this guy? He's amazing. He makes videos on YouTube. I have no idea what movies he made. But still, we are talking about magic. Um, so I'm taking the definition of magic from Wikipedia, but basically it's the idea that you can influence stuff with superpowers. Um, anybody have superpowers here? They, they dissect you at the CIA office or something, no? Um, okay, magic doesn't really exist in, the world, in, in this world. Okay, Harry Potter was 20 years ago, it's time to grow up. Um, <laughs> Magic is a trick. Magic is composed by tricks. Um, I really like this particular movie. This is The Prestige. I guess pretty much anyone has seen it. It's a blockbuster, so it's not necessarily a high quality movie, but it's a good movie. Um, the idea is that every trick starts with something very ordinary. So you're showing something to the audience and you say, this is normal. We're used to it. And then, you know, this is quite okay. You know, you take a foo, you make it to upper, right? You replace some characters, then you split it and you var dump it. Seems clean, right? I think everyone knows what this does. So this is just going to dump some boo here. And then you need to make it extraordinary. So that's the turn. You need to do something that looks weird and that people are gonna squint their eyes. So let's look at the same thing here. So we're requiring some magic.elephant. <laughs> we are creating our thing, then we, we initialize the magic. And we ask your twopper, we replace something, we split it, and we war dump it. And so far so good, right? It does the same thing. And then comes the third part, which is what we call the prestige. The point is, even if this is a trick and you can find out, you don't really want to find out, you want to be taken as a fool. You want to not really know what is going on. So let's look at it and let's confuse the heck out of you. Can anybody read this? Is this easier? <laughs> so, Let's go through it. This is a piece of code that appeared on the internet recently. The author is known in the community here. So we have a function magic. Magic receives some packet of data. And then since we are using the latest PHP stuff, we create a new object. We create a new class with the packet. And this will be received from the constructor. We pass it in as a reference. References are bad, we'll see about that later, but still, they're fun. You can hurt yourself really, really bad with them. And then we call something on it. And that's pretty much where the magic happens. So we have some function name. You can call anything on this object. It doesn't matter. We get some function call on it. And effectively, we pass in some random parameters, and we merge the parameters with the current value and the arguments. So that's kind of freaky, I think. And then obviously you return this because fluent interfaces are cool. So effectively, the point is there is no trick at all. Yeah, this is like from the movie, the coin has two faces. Yeah? That's kind of the idea. There is no magic there. But since it takes so long to understand what is going on, your brain is actually taking it for magic. This is actually produced by a real witch. Uh, this is Andrea Fodds. If you don't know her, go follow her. She, she's amazing. Tweets too much about anime and stuff, but on the PHP side, she does some very, very ugly stuff that you can learn. 
Um, apparently, I'm also a magician. I categorize as that. And this is not because of my PHP skills, but um, I first of all managed to trick iBuildings into inviting me here. Thank you, Yoni. Um, and uh, you know, I'm a technical speaker. I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm going to demotivate you here at this call. So, um, and I managed to procrastinate in preparing this talk for, I think, three months. I, and actually, five months. For five months, I didn't write slides, and then I wrote them on the train coming here. Um, I procrastinated so much that I merged something like 60 pull requests just to not do the slides. So, and also, I survived 17 years of PHP. Who here has more than 17 years of PHP work? I'm so sorry for you. But I understand. I fully understand you. And sometimes I manage to make enterprise projects not fail. You know, it's mostly politics, but kind of makes it magic. So I wrote a lot of libraries. And here's a piece of advice. Don't use them. Relatively simple. Don't use a library if I wrote it. And I also don't know how they work. You know, I put it there. I forgot about it. I don't ever want to look at that again. So how do we write magic? Magic is magic just because it's hard to follow. It doesn't really mean that it's magic. So the first thing we need to get is you need to understand everything in the language. You need to understand the language, how it works. And you need to understand the rules, all the restrictions of the language. You can do this, you can't do that. And magically, usually avoids all these rules. That's where you're like squinting your eyes and saying, oh my god, what is going on? So this thing really works only if I go there. I'm going to do it like this now. Um, so generally, um, it's dangerous. Don't do it alone. Or at least if you do it alone, do it in a protected environment, like disconnected from the internet, please. Right? You don't need to say, oh yeah, I made this. Here's this great idea, and everyone is going to abuse it. And also, magic can be misinterpreted. Just because you can make everything with magic doesn't mean that it's going to be useful. So you have a call static here. If everything is call static and you get objects all the time and then you complain about types, then you probably misunderstood where magic should be used. So the first thing we need to understand is the PHP Swiss Army knife of magic. And I think that is the reflection API. And I was talking with Pierre Joy the other day, and he was like, yeah, we first initially designed it so we could do some stuff, some freaky stuff, but we weren't expecting people to actually use it in production. And now I think everyone is relying on magic libraries that do all this at runtime in production. So now I want to have hands up if you heard about this feature. And I want you to put down the hand only once you got to a feature that you did not use. So you use reflection, hands up. Right? OK. Construct. I think everyone is using it. Keep it up. OK? If you don't do this, then you probably have a problem. Right? OK? Um, destruct. Who is using destruct in their code? All right? Invoke. More hands down. Invoke makes an object we have like a, a closure, kind of. Sleep. I see more hands going down. That's good. Wake up. All right, it's slowly dying down. Um, get and set. I think everyone used those. Come on. If you had more than three, four years of experience, you always wanted to make everything with get and set because you're like, oh my god, why do I have to do all these methods? <laughs> um, set. Keep them up. Clone. OK, no, keep them up if you, never, if you use those. Call. All right, call static. I see everyone went down with Set state. There is still somebody with a hand up. One, two. All right. Is set. No, no, keep them up, but if you, you got them down, the hands. Don't put them up again. Unset. Chris, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and debug info. All right, so nobody wins the elephant. 
All right, so the other stuff that you really need to know is closure bind and the closure stuff. And since we like ugly stuff, we now have closure call because this way you can do magic faster. James, your clicker is done. Oh, it is actually clicking. It's clicking on the wrong screen. Well, fair enough. So, this is not working at all again. You want a tip? Don't write your slides with React. <laughs> all right. Then you have variable references. Then you can re have references to keys in arrays. So in the array, you can reference stuff. But you can also have references to properties of objects. So it's becoming really ugly. And then you have also this family of stuff. So call, call user func, I think everyone started to use that. Um, then we have func get args. This is what we used to do until we had PHP 5.6. Then debug backtrace. If you start using debug backtrace for magic, that means that you're trying to understand who is the caller of your code. You're doing some really naughty stuff there. Then you have us, is set, unset, and the array cast. So I think this is a lot of stuff that I added there. But what we are doing is we are taking existing rules in the language and we are creating new rules. And please do this only if you have a reason to do so. So um, what we want to do as a first example of something magic that we can write is we want to touch and modify the state of an object without interacting with the object directly. And you will say, you can just use reflection. And I'm like, oh, that's boring. Let's complicate things. So we have a person object, OK? We want to modify this. All right, this person has a constructor, receives a name, and then we have a say hello. And it will say, hello, I am with the name. Relatively simple. So we want to modify this. In order to modify this, you can do it the boring way, or you can invent some magic contraption that will make everyone's head spin. So here's the thing. I, I could make the Zalgo text also for this one, but I think we already made the joke there. So we have a puppeteer. The puppeteer is an object, and by the way, I have no idea. If, yeah, it looks OK. Good. Uh, receives a puppet. I'm not yet on 7.2. It's going to be in like a couple of weeks. But until then, we can't have the object hint. So it receives a puppet. And then with this puppet, we are going to reflect on it. We are going to just find out what is this? How does it look like? And by the way, this is example code. There are already bugs. I already have a bug here. I will not go into detail. But you can really, really hurt yourself just because of that. Um, after that, we are going to loop over all the properties. So for every property, in this class, we're going to call it p. We are going to define a closure. And this closure receives a list of properties by reference. And it will use the current property. And then it will populate the property with the key name, you know, this name here. It will populate it with a reference to the object's property. <laughs> Is anybody already feeling sick? Is that right? <laughs> and then you bind it to the object. So the puppet is the object that you're interacting with. And you have to bind to the name of the class as well. So this closure here will perform, will execute in the scope of the object that you're bounding to. And so now we bound to it. And then we call it. I, I don't bother making the code more readable. It needs to be complicated. It's on purpose, right? And then you have a magic set here. And what set will do is it will modify these properties, which is an array up here. Hard to see, but still. And we are modifying the value. So that's relatively simple. So what happened? Well, relatively, I guess. So what we're going to create is a person. This is me. I, I am an object in a programming language. I'm a, just a reference to a memory address. And you say hello, and that's going to be saying hello, Marco. And then you create a puppeteer, and you modify the puppet name, and you say Ben, and you say hello, and there you go. You got your output. Hello, I'm Marco, and hello, I'm Ben. All right? Confusing enough? 
This has actually use cases. I, I'm telling you, there is actually a legit use case. You have a state machine. You want to write tests for that state machine. You don't want to go crazy. You just set the state of the state machine via this without exposing the public API of your object, without cluttering it, and you can write very efficient tests that work well. Yes, you are touching in the internals of the object, but that's still better than defining a public API just because you want to test something. So let's look at something that Doctrine uses. So this was a, um, a library, for example. This was built by Lee Davis. Um, he made a library called Alter Ego, which does exactly this. So in Doctrine ORM, we use something a bit more obscure. So what we do is we lazy load properties. Who is using the ORM, by the way? Who likes it? Who dislikes it? Yeah, me too. All right. So let's, let's first introduce some concepts about the object model of PHP. What you should do, know is that PHP is basically just a big pile of hacks, and then it became a programming language at some point. Um, so especially with objects, objects were introduced in PHP 5.4, I think, and then the visibility was introduced later via hack. So can anybody tell me what this is doing? Anybody didn't already talk to me about this? We are casting an array to an object. It's setting the property bar to buzz. Yes, that's true. But you get something freaky here. So you cast to it. Whoops, 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 whoops. That's too much. Sorry. All right. I'm just not good at this. All right. So what you got here is an STD class. You can't pronounce STD class with that STD. Um, but, um, and you get a private bar. <laughs> you know? Um, that's kind of freaky. So we got a private property on an STD class, except that nobody ever defined private properties on an STD class. We don't have control over the definition of this object. OK, so what is going on? All right, let's try reading that property, right? As we wrote it, we're going to read it. So I'm going to try and read this property. Now, this works on PHP 5.1.0. And then it broke because they find out. So <laughs> this, this is not a good idea. Don't do this. But this is something that in PHP 5, one, you could have used to access any private property of any object, which is kind of cool, kind of. So yeah, this is my awesome presentation skills. It's going to the right. But so what you get is you get an uncaught error, cannot access a property started with a backslash zero. So you can't start uh, accessing properties. We, we start with backslash zero. Is this going more to the right? What is going on? More, yeah. OK, so what is this property? This property is actually a private property. What is interesting is that in PHP, this backslash zero is the way that PHP actually stores the visibility of properties. So if you try to accessing it like this, you will get a notice. You say, oh, property is undefined. You say, there is no property bar because it's private. This one is private. There is no bar when you try accessing it publicly. So yeah, that's also kind of weird. Um, so how do we read this property? How can we act on it? So um, let's try going with the big guns. I'm going to try and use reflection. So if I try accessing this property via reflection, this will also fail. So I'm going to create a reflection property with full bar and try setting it accessible and trying to read it. And we are going to get an exception that says uncut reflection exception. Class foo does not exist. Well, you're right. This class does not exist. So how the hell are we supposed to, to access this? Uh, let, let's, let's go even more complicated. We got closures. Let's try reading them. Um, so what we're going to try is we're going to try to bind the closure to a class foo and an instance, which is the instance that we created. And we are going to try to read this buzz 
with this particular scope. So we are really trying hard to get to the right scope in order to read this property. And even here, this will fail because closure bind will not throw an exception. It will throw a warning and then it will return false. Yeah, PHP is beautifully consistent. And uh, it's consistently inconsistent. So yes, yeah, so first of all, you get a class food around and then you get a um, call on null, sorry, not false, null. For once, it's consistent there, that's good. So, what we effectively got here is the only way to define an immutable object in PHP. <laughs> Except that I lied. Yeah. Um, because, you know, um, references, and if you work with them, they're terrible. So what I can do is, you know, like I can define a value and then I can use a reference up here. And if I cast, what I'm going to get is an object that doesn't contain a value. It contains a reference to a value, which is also kind of weird. So there we go. Our hopes for immutability in the language are also gone. So references generally ruin anything, everything at all. I think every language designer around PHP knows that references are like the Big Bang. You start from one and you get a million of them. So <clears throat> here's another ugly one you can do with references. You have function foo and you got something passed in by reference and you are going to loop over something and you're going to yield a generator. So this function returns an iterator and then you define this bar value, you call the function and iterate over all the values and we're going to just dump var to verify, and then after the loop, it changes, because this happens after the loop. So what is nice is that you can have millions and millions and millions of iterations here, and then before you are doing your very important stuff, like committing, everything breaks. That's kind of nice of the language. Okay, so the point is we still learn something. We learn that PHP objects are effectively just hash maps internally this backslash zero, backslash zero stuff. And if it is a hash map, you can do something with it. You can remove keys from it. You can remove keys. And what happens if a key is missing? So it's all hash maps internally. And uh, so let's go back to our problem. We wanted to load something from the database. We have our object. There is something inside the object. And that particular field needs to be loaded from the database. So, you got a thing, right? You take, we want to, to make this particular field loaded lazily. It comes from the database somewhere. Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Not my problem. I just, I'm just here to make things complicated, so. Um, all right, so we create the thing, we say something, then we unset the field. Can anybody tell me what this will do? What will be produced here as output? No? No takers? All right, so what happens here is that you get an undefined property. You get a notice. Well, it still executes then, hello, space. But um, you got a notice. And if you dig into the engine, you get to figure out that you can do something very, very, very ugly. So what you can do is you can define a magic getter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what will happen now is that this particular block will not produce a notice anymore because the notice is just a fallback when this method is not defined. So when this method is defined, it will be called, and now we can load our stuff from the database. Yeah. And if you have an enterprise whatever, yada yada, and you're using the ORM, uh, which I'm really sorry for, you can actually say, yes, this entire thing is a castle of cards relying on this particular mechanism. So the point is the rule is there. It's in the language. I didn't modify anything. This stuff works out of the box. What we did is we just modified the behavior in an unexpected way. So if you show this to a language de designer, they're gonna go like, oh yeah, I designed this, but I never expected you to use it this way. Yeah, sorry, it's too late now. 
Okay. Um, no blame on the language designers. The blame is on me here for finding and using this stuff. But it's a defined behavior. And the problem is that it can't be changed anymore now. So <clears throat> this discovery was not happening overnight. There is a person that found out about this, I think, randomly. There is no way for you to go and find these things unless you are really good at C code and want to go into the engine and try to figure out everything you can do with the engine. You can do ugly things, but this doesn't happen overnight. It's not like, oh my god, I can do this. I'm going to find out a way to make it work. So Lucas, Lucas Smith uh, from Leap, he actually discovered this initially. I think in 2011 or something, he found this trick. It was something, you know, innocent. It's just that I, you know, I have a wicked mind. So I had to misuse it somehow. So I already saw it working. I said, okay, we can do this. We can do this ugly stuff that actually solves so many problems. We're not going into detail in the problems, but it actually solves a real world problem that we have. So since I wasn't really sure if this was a bug, or a feature, you know, it's PHP after all. Yeah. Um, I started investigating. So I happened to be sent to a conference. IPC 2012 was, a, I would say, a very good conference. And um, um, I was talking to random people. And then we had a discussion about this thing that I was talking about, the, the trick that Lucas discovered, these unset properties. And they told me, you know what? There's like people here that are working with the PHP core language. So go ask them if this is actually working behavior or not. And uh, so I, I went and I asked Derek. I'm not sure if Derek is here. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, Derek, it's also on you. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked Derek, is this actually the expected behavior? And he was like, mm, I'm not sure. Mm, yeah, yeah, I think it is. And Derek said, you know what, um, make a test for it. If this is something that we can discuss and, and it's the defined behavior of the language um, and currently it's undefined, there is no specification for it, let's make a specification. So the other person I talked to at that conference was Ilya, um, whom I didn't see at any conferences recently, so I don't know what he's doing right now, but he was also working on the engine. And I remember that conference, he made a talk about traits and why they're bad. Just remember that. That was 2012, and they already knew. So what happens is that I submitted my first patch to PHP Core. And I think the other patches are, are as irrelevant as this one. So uh, what I did is I just added a test. I made sure that this particular behavior that I was going to rely upon for very, very big libraries was not going to be changed or not accidentally changed because this actually happened. This is a regression. Something happened. Um, so I sent the patch and that's how I became a PHP core contributor. So I got a php.net email even though all I do is bother people on the mailing list. So, and to be honest, this also <laughs> <laughs> spawned some, some disagreement. So yeah, not everyone was happy. I like there's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It starts from, at the beginning, there was the universe. The universe was created, and everyone disagreed with that. Um, Dan also disagrees, and I think everyone in room 11 on Stack Overflow disagrees with me on this stuff, but it happened. Sorry, deal with it. So don't mess with Dan. Dan, where are you? Ah, there we go. <laughs> All right, so um, then I continue to research. I needed some inspiration, some research material. That is not a microscope. Um, so after that, I continued to design and to work on it. I turned what looked like a bug initially, I turned it into a feature in PHP. And after that, I made a huge piece of design around it. And it landed in Doctrine or I'm internally. And I also overnight started building a library, which is this one. Um, and um, yeah, if you're using this, you should be worried. But still, um, building this library got me to my first conference, which is this one where I spoke publicly. I was spoken about proxies, and I actually introduced all these concepts already. So if you're here and you don't remember this stuff, you should check out um, your memory skills. You know? 
So a lot of people use this, yeah. And uh, yeah, then they say, you know what? Let's add it to Symfony. So this is Symfony. I added it to the framework, to Symfony. It's everywhere. It's ruining the world. So now it's, it's too big to fail. Um, you know, the point is, while writing this library, I went like really, 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 really baby steps uh, because you are touching magic. So you find edge cases on anything. Yeah? For example, you find this weird edge case if the planets are aligned yeah, and the pigs fly and uh, you're running Gentoo and you compiled PHP with uh, minus 0.2, uh, then you get a seg fault. Yeah? That's basically what happens in most of the bugs that get reported on this, and I can't do much about it. Sometimes I even find PHP core bugs and I report them. So you need to really work eagerly to fix these bugs because they will um, be reported in a very, very eager way. Yeah. Um, I think that you just add a class and you've, everything crashes. It's not even just PHP unit crashes, it's the entire process dies. It's not just a failure. You get a seg fault and good luck debugging that. So um, there are many libraries that use this approach. I think they build something magic, they rely on it, and in my opinion, they are also quite good. So um, the first one I really, really like, and I use it for all my libraries nowadays, is Humbug. Has anybody heard of it? Anybody using it at work? No, at work, nobody. Yeah. Why that? Because this is a deceptive, a deceptive, I don't even know how to pronounce it, library. It modifies your code while you are loading it during the tests and modifies things around it and verifies if your code still runs and if you didn't just write crap tests, which is kind of cool. So it's going to replace things here and there and it will tell you, you know what? I managed to introduce a security issue in your library and none of your tests caught it. The other one that is really useful is PHP Unit Volkswagen. <laughs> so once you plug in Humbug, you can run PHP Unit Volkswagen and all the tests are green again. <laughs> you know, the environment is happy and so on. And then there's stuff that I don't understand at all. Like, for example, there's uh, AMP PSP. So I was really happy the other day. I was hacking on Haskell, running this tiny server that is compiled, super optimized C code that uses threads and whatever. And I'm getting like 6,000 requests, 6, 7,000 requests per second on my computer. Right? And then Niklas Keller, who is also hanging around uh, in the PHP internal stuff, comes over and says, you know what, try this. It's a concurrency framework that has happens to have an HTTP framework in it. And he said, you know, just try this and it runs with PHP and it made something like 26,000 requests per second. I was like, Whoa, what is going on? So, you know, that's stuff that I don't understand. But what is cool about it is that they managed to use generators and the mechanisms that uh, Chris was talking about. I don't know if today or yesterday, uh, coroutines to make things work asynchronously even though they look synchronous. We have built libraries to make um, object-oriented anti-patterns work correctly. Uh, so this is Doctrine Instantiator. Instantiator is a library that allows you to create objects without calling the constructor. Is it a good idea? Maybe not. Um, then there's this one. I love this one. This one is taking, this, this is PingQ. Anybody know LingQ? from C Sharp, yeah. It's uh, integrated queries. I don't remember what the L stands for, but whatever. Um, this is PHP integrated queries. And what you can do with it, and by the way, it's experimental. It was just built as an experiment, is stuff that is really freaky in my opinion. So you got this kind of code. Um, so you're going to select from a database. You select the table customers, then you filter where age is below 50, and you order by first name ascending, right? And then you select some values from it, and you say, give me an array from this. And what this library does is it will analyze your code, as in reflect it, as in doing some really, really hardcore reflection stuff, and it will convert it to this, right? So this is an SQL query that does all this. So you're pushing the code from PHP into SQL. 
Is it a good idea? I don't know, but people write JavaScript in MongoDB, so I don't know. <laughs> so you got this table. The table gets translated to this select, subselect specifically. Um, then you got a where, and the where gets translated to a where down there. And you know you got your order by, and the order by goes down there. And at the end, you also got the selection, which is like weird that it even understands this. So you got this translated to a concatenation expression. That's freaky. That's really cool. You know, it 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 makes you, you know, tremble if you want to put this into production because you can't really predict what will go on. Let's let's admit it. This is this is not good SQL. You know, it doesn't look good. It's probably going to be optimized by the optimizer, but you may be out of luck. Um, yesterday I learned, for example, that if you put a comment anywhere in the SQL, the optimizer just kicks out and it doesn't do anything, at least in my SQL. So, you know, it's, it's interesting what you can do with it. So why? Well, because it's fun, because it's fun, it's evil. I love this stuff, you know, it keeps me up at night and it's, it's just like, I need to do this next horrible thing. It's amazing, you know? I need to ruin someone's weekend. <laughs> Any, anybody wonder how PHP unit marks work? You don't want to know, that's it. There is like, there's another library that I really love, which is the AOP framework built uh, by Alexander Lysashenko. He made a talk about it here last year. Um, Aspect-oriented programming, was designed by really wise people at companies like IBM and Sun Microsystems and stuff like that. But I'm not sure if it is a design or a very, very elaborate troll. Um, so let's take this. We have a class foo. And the class foo has a method bar and a method buzz. They don't do anything. So there's no real way for us to know whether they were called during the execution of our program unless you use the stuff uh, developed by Derek, but that's counting as cheating because you're really putting something in the engine. What we are doing instead is we're using magic. So we're going to create this new foo and we are going to execute this bar and buzz and then at some point somewhere else we configure this thing. This thing is a catch-all, implements an aspect which comes from this uh, library and we are going to say that before the execution of any method name with any parameters on any class, we are going to call this before anything. And this will var dump the method name onto the console. So what we get is something like that. We get the var and buzz, and the code was this one. Yeah. Is it a good idea? I don't know. I don't know. As I said, I'm here to make things complicated. I'm not helping you. So, other stuff that I really like is uh, James. Where's James? Yeah, are you still alive? Yeah, it's good. Okay, um, James, I, I, I tricked him into building this library. Um, so he built this better reflection thing. So the idea is very simple. And we actually ha had, had good intentions. Um, not anymore, but still, we had good intentions, and the idea was relatively simple. So we wanted to analyze code without loading it. What if you download a huge piece of code from the internet, and you don't know if there's a malware in it? Before you run it, can you reflect it? Can you find out something? And this is what this library does. So this library will analyze code exactly like reflection does, but it will do so without loading the code. It will just read the files, which is also kind of cool. But you can use it for you know, more fun stuff. So here we have a class random number. It returns a number. It's a perfectly random number. Um, I can assure you that. This is from an XKCD, by the way. Yes, I'm copying jokes. I'm so miserable, sorry. Um, and then you do some weird stuff here. You create a class reflector and then you create a class loader and you add a class. So this is kind of like an auto-loading hijack system. And then what we do is we get a method from this class, you know, from this random number, we get a method, which by the way, I mistyped, but whatever. And you can do a set body from closure. So you're going to replace the contents of that method with the closure that you defined there. And when you run it, 
your random number four jumps five, right? Is this a good idea? <laughs> I have problems staying serious. So <laughs> that's not how this works. Like <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad idea overall. Um, so yeah, um, other stuff that you built is like strict PHP. Uh, strict PHP is a library that you enable. You say, this is where my code is, and it turns PHP into Java. <laughs> <laughs> is it a good idea? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Actually, I know, but I will not tell you. And then there's Christopher. Christopher did a lot of talks about this, um, talks and discussions, I would say. Uh, he does a thing called preprocess IO. So what you can do with it is you can write some code like this. So this is going to uh, execute some deferred piece of code. So you have a print first, and then print last, and then print in between. And the defer code will be executed as last. Is this a good idea? I don't know. But the code that it generates says no. Uh, so this is what it does. It will create a first. Then it will create this deferred thing and it will use a closure and pass in all the scope and extract the scope so you can execute everything with the current scope. Um, yeah, I mean, the idea is amazing. What happens is that this deferred object will execute the rapid closure when the destructor is called. Mm, yeah, it's not a good idea in my opinion, but you can do some interesting stuff with it. That's the point. It's just mechanisms. It's like the atomic bomb. You can use it for good. No, wait, that's not how it works. <laughs> um, um, yeah. <laughs> so magic, in my opinion, also has, on the other side, an extremely, extremely high cost. Anytime you introduce magic in your code, you are making things much more complicated for the consumers. So um, anybody remember this? This was the typed hint, uh, type hints for properties RFC. Remember that? Anybody want that? I think, yeah, a lot of people actually really wanted this at some point. It would make some code much more easy. But the fact is that this broke every library that relied on this magic. So effectively, the magic, the fact that we introduced all this magic made it really complicated to introduce language features. Obviously, I'm on the side of stability, so if something works, it should continue working. But there are a lot of discussions with it. We introduced the magic. We made a lot of problems actually much more concrete. So every language change is now something that you need to test against. It's not like, oh yeah, we upgraded from PHP 7.1.1 to 7.1.2 and it just works. No, they may have just changed something really tiny that you relied upon and suddenly everything breaks. So this is our fault magic library creators. But we can't really fix it at this point. It's too late, yeah? we're doomed. So you should consider it, every piece of magic that you write as harmful. You should consider it um, pretty much um, a problem because you are breaking expectations. Something that should work in a way doesn't work in a way anymore. It doesn't work in that way anymore. And that makes it really, really hard to follow. If you break expectations, your tools are also breaking. Your ID is breaking, your testing framework breaks, everything breaks, yeah? Because everything is built on those expectations. And, you know, it's also considered magic because it's hard to follow. If it is hard to follow, you probably don't want to maintain it because you don't even remember what you were doing. So what is good magic? There is good magic, in my opinion. There is stuff that we can consider as good. Um, first of all, it must be useful. You can't just make a library just because you want to do. Yes, you can, but at least put a disclaimer on it. You say, this is not useful. Please don't use it. Um, but the point is, good magic is also making your code better. You put the magic in there, and it just works, and it looks easy to read. One good example is the preprocess I.O. library. That preprocess I.O. library makes it really easy to understand that that piece of code will be executed later. How? Not your problem. But it will do that. So 
it stays out of the way. You don't have to worry about the internals. So if you have a stack trace and you see a lot of magic in it, that's probably a problem. It's really, really, really hard to understand what your program is doing if there are thousands of hidden layers doing things that you don't expect to happen. And um, they are reliable, they don't break. These libraries, they don't break, as in they were well tested. They are maintained against also newer versions of PHP. They are writing tests to even check if the nightly version, which is PHP 7.2 right now, is going to break anything. So these libraries are good libraries, in my opinion. So the other problem with magic in general is that if it looks like a duck, you know, and it walks like a duck, and then the debugger segfaults, that is probably magic. <laughs> magic breaks in completely unexpected ways. Because you broke all the expectations, you don't have any expectations on what can happen next. That's really, really bad. So it's a massive, massive foot gun. You can really, really hurt yourself. So um, yeah, it gives you like the, oh my god, what is that effect. But the point is that is for demos. It's for this presentation. It's for entertaining you. It's not for your work. You don't bring it to your workplace. You don't, you don't you know, go around Amsterdam and say, yeah, look, man, no hands on the bike. I mean, that's a really, really good way to get killed in Amsterdam. Um, but yeah, uh, and sometimes it gives you the ah effect. You're like, what the hell is going on? Yeah? Magic kind of gives you like unexpected behaviors, like this one. One time I saw a developer make an entire database disappear, just poof, magic. Um, <laughs> there was a database abstraction library that did this. You forgot a parameter on a deletion somewhere, and it was a magic API. And I don't want to link libraries because this is something that happens library maintainers, and it deleted the entire table just because you forgot something. You don't want that to happen in production. Yeah? And also, that's a very, very simple vector to exploit for security issues. So isolate it, keep it hidden, don't give it to your users. It's like, it's like the knife. You don't give it to little children. And yes, users that don't know what this magic is about are like little children. It's like the radioactivity. You treat it like radioactivity. You keep it isolated. The point is radioactivity is really, really, really useful in research, in medical environments, and so on and so forth. And a little bit is really required, but a lot of it will kill you. It's relatively simple. But let's say it, yes, this is demoralizing. Please do experiment. If you have an idea, if you have something wicked that could be useful, please do implement it because you could work, you know? You could make something amazing out of it. And um, if you ever think like magic is bad period, you know, you're never gonna get anywhere. A CPU is basically a stone. You know, it's a piece of sand. We put it in an oven. We put some laser on it, which by the way, laser is like a ruby with some metal around it. And that's it. And, and we make CPUs. All our working environment is just rocks with a battery attached to it, you know? So a single change, a single thing that you make different with magic could actually help a lot of developers. You could write something that makes an entire family of patterns deprecated just because it works better. This doesn't mean that it will happen. This means that it could happen. You find something that is so amazing, such a little tiny thing, that could improve everyone's life as a developer. So by the way, we're not fixing the world here. You know, we're not fixing world hunger. This is just about development. Don't get it over your head. Um, so please go out, find something that you want to make magic. You say, oh yes, I know how this stuff works. I'm going to use magic my way. I like the fact that Christopher is doing it. I like the fact that James is doing it. Derek is doing it at engine level. Thank you, Derek, for 15 years of X debug. Um, and uh, Niklas Keller is doing it in IMP, for example. And other people are doing amazing things that I don't understand. I will never understand, but they keep it safe and easy to use and stable. And that's good. So find, first of all, a non-magic way to make it work. If there is something that you want to do, see how it works without the magic first. Because 
you know, magic is not necessarily better. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should, okay? But then you can decide, yes, I'm going to try and use magic to solve this problem, and it's going to improve everything I do. Then you need to make it yours. This means you need to learn this trick and learn it inside out. This stupid trick with the unset, it was taught to me by Lucas, and then I bragged about it for four years, and it got into libraries and everything, and it works, and it's stable, and so on and so forth. And if it breaks, I also know why. That's the point. If somebody has a problem about it, they can ask me. And I kind of know how it is happening and why. So <coughs> the point is you should not consider it magic. It should be like a magic trick. You do it like while reading a book, you're doing magic on the other hand. Um, so document all of it. Try to find out what the edge cases are. Make sure that the person that comes next to you will have an idea of what is going on. And this means also testing it. Testing it keeps it stable. Test all of it. Make sure it is usable by everyone. Um, make it disappear. I know the magic, making the magic disappear is not what the aim is of magic, but it makes it useful. Once you make it disappear, that's not really romantic. <laughs> but, but you can still make people go, oh my god, what is going on? It's like they will still appreciate what you're doing. So you can have your short moment of glory. You're like, yes, I'm a magician. I did the show. Everyone is happy about being fooled, you know? And I look so smart and whatever. Um, after that, teach your tricks to somebody else. You can write documentation. You can write test. I don't care. Just bring it on and make sure that people that use it for good are using it, you know, like not nuclear power. At that point, you can consider yourself a real magician. Thank you very much. <laughs>